Welcome to the fall uh, installment of the Max Pickerel Lecture Series here at Colby Community College. We have some very generous donors who have provided funds that allow us to put these lectures on. We don't have anybody scheduled uh, for the spring yet, but keep your eyes open. I'm sure we'll let you know when, as sure as we have someone ready to uh, speak for us. We'd like to welcome those of you who are watching us online as we're recording this for them. So um, our speaker tonight is Mr. Ron Freeman. He is a noted speaker. He has bachelor's and master's degrees from Pitt State. And he is, from what I've read, in the Gorilla Hall of Fame uh, as an athlete. He played football, and he has played for people or teams in the United States Football League, if you remember that, and also uh, the Kansas City Chiefs and Buffalo Bills in the NFL. So he is here to talk to us tonight about uh, issues of rethinking race, and uh, I hope that uh, you will learn from what he has to say. So if you'll join me in welcoming Mr. Freeman to the stage. Good evening and good evening. I should probably turn my mic on so you can hear me. How about that? Do that. Let's see, is that it? Yeah, there it is. All right, okay. Good evening, good evening, good evening. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, and I'm going to go over this way because apparently there's a problem. There, that's better. <coughs> uh, but uh, thank you. Uh, now, where was I? That's uh, a little bit of a distraction. Um, when I think about my life and my journey, I, I think about our country, I think about racial issues and kind of the things that I've seen as I've walked through my life. And then just kind of in studying and looking at things and trying to be critical in a, in a, in a thought towards our nation and the things that we have to offer, it's been a kind of an eye-opening experience. And uh, obviously I've been around for a little while, longer than most of you. Uh, and as I walk this journey, I felt like I've had a unique experience in a lot of ways. Uh, because I felt like there's been this real positive experience that I've had that isn't necessarily shared by everyone. And I wonder about the roots of that and yours, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later. But I really started thinking a few years ago, I was working in the, with the school district in Kansas City as a leadership consultant. And we were focused on leadership and growing leaders and, and, and creating an environment that was uh, really a community of advocates where people learn to work together, value one another, and really set high standards and really push towards it. And we're doing that course, and uh, the superintendent uh, asked me if I could meet him outside the city to have a conversation about something important to him. And I said, sure. So we went, we met outside the city. His first question to me in that moment was, can your training prove that this community is racist? And I thought that was an odd question. And honestly, my training wouldn't prove that anyone's racist because the, the goal and objective of my training is to eliminate biases. It's really to help people see each other in a light that is affirming and valuing not in the sense of you're bad and you're not bad, you're good, and, but really to have that understanding. But when he asked me that question, it caused me to really step back and rethink my attitude toward race and kind of where they came from. How do I look at life? And there's so much to it. But I want to talk a little bit tonight about our country, about race in America. And it's really an interesting journey, really a, a more intriguing story than a lot of people realize. I don't know, how many of you guys uh, raise your hand? got to see or read any of the uh, New York Times uh, 1619 uh, report, article. Okay, so it was an interesting take uh, where they went back and looked at uh, history through the lens of race as it pertains to slaves, uh, slavery in America, and basically the entirety of the black experience in America and America itself was built on the, the institution of slavery. And I thought about that. That was part of that mix at the time as well. I started looking at and evaluating how did the whole thing get started? It's really a fascinating story. Uh, because what most people don't know about the, the North Atlantic slave trade was that it actually started in the 15th century. So it's like, oh, really? 
before there was a Columbus, before there were pilgrims, before there were British colonies, literally a hundred years before, there was slavery, and it was really driven by the Portuguese. Uh, Portuguese slave traders actually went to uh, Angola, uh, the Congo, the Republic of the Congo, and that uh, they were there as missionaries, which is interesting. As missionaries, they began working with people, and during their time as missionaries, they noticed that when tribes would go to war, the winner would often take the loser and, and into forced servitude or slavery. And they thought it was, huh, interesting concept. What if we did that too? They had an agricultural operations there, so they began to take slaves from those conflicts and use that labor to produce what they wanted. And then the Portuguese one day started thinking about how they could use this to their advantage. And they came up with this idea, why don't we start taking slaves from here to other countries, primarily in Central and South America. If we do that, we can make money and we can do this, and they, uh, so they began to export slaves. What was interesting was that the people of the Congo rose up under King Alfonso, who was the king at that, uh, at that time, rose up and said, no way, you're not allowed to take people from this nation to wherever you're taking them. We, we can't stand for that. And the people began to riot and protest to fight against it because they couldn't. And it's interesting that they were okay enslaving them themselves, but the idea of being exported was that you crossed the line there. And as political things work out, the king began to negotiate with the Portuguese and came up with the narrative that made it, hey, you know, maybe it's okay if we do this, maybe it's for the better good. People didn't necessarily like it, but they went along with it, and that's how the North Atlantic slave trade began. Rather remarkable. And it happened, again, in Central and South America, not in North America so much, but actually prior to 1619, when the first slave, uh, well, when the British colony had their first what we call slaves. And I'll tell you about that story in a minute. But in that time frame, the Spanish and the French, the French primarily in Haiti, and the Spanish in San Domingo, they were what we call chattel slavery. That's when it's your life, you can't change, we own you, your property. That was the way of slavery there. British colonies in 1619, we'll jump into that water now, in 1619, the British colonies did not have slavery. They had what we called indentured servants. And basically, indentured servanthood was a contract between consenting individuals. And basically, when the British first came here to the colonies, they needed, they needed work, they needed workers. And they would, people who didn't have the money to come would sign a contract no longer than seven years to work farm or whatever the job or task was uh, and work off their servanthood for seven years and at the end of that seven years they would get 40 acres and a mule. That was where that concept, if you ever heard that concept, that's where that came from. So you have this unfolding story of the British colonies in 1619 and they get introduced to the Af North American slave trade by accident. There was a, a ship that, that sailed from Angola, and that's an interesting story. I, um, we'll get into that one. So there's a conflict between two tribes in Angola, and they go to war one day. And this is on a specific day, they fight. The side that loses, actually 300 of them are taken captive. 300 people are taken captive from the Congo. Angola is on the coast there. and. They marched from the Congo to Angola, which was about 125 miles, I think it was. But in that time, in the march from Angola to, or from the Congo to Angola, that 300 was cut in half. Only 150 survived. Now you can imagine, you just went through a bloody war, a fight that was whatever, swords and spears and stabbings and hitting and and all the pain and through that, and then after that, you're taking on a 125 mile march. And you're not walking on paved streets, you're walking through brush, you're walking on slippery surfaces, you're walking through sand, you're walking through all sorts of uh, rocks, and, and all the, the pain and anguish, that 125 mile journey killed 150 people. So it was brutal, it was hard. And then they get to Angola where they're put in uh, holding cells. 
the slaves and held in, held in captivity there until a time when they could be transported by a Portuguese slave ship to Central or South America. Or in this particular case, they were going to go to Mexico. By the time they board the ship to go from Angola to Mexico, there are only 60 people left. Think about the horror of that. We started out with 300 of us. And over a period of about three weeks, four weeks, we're down to 60. They've watched 240 of their own people die. This is a tragedy. This is a hardship. This is the evil of the institution of slavery, that we would do that to that many people. And then when the Portuguese slave ship is headed into the Gulf of Mexico, to take these slaves to Mexico, they're intercepted by a British pirate ship. And this pirate ship thinks we're gonna get gold, silver, we're gonna get treasure, we're gonna get money, we're gonna get rich. And when they stop the boat, when they board it, when they go into the cargo hold, they find 25 slaves or so. Anybody remember how many we started out with? How many left now? That's, that's brutal, isn't it? That's harsh, that's severe. And there's so many things that go into that. When you think about the tragedy or the travesty or the evil of slavery, to take someone, to force them, in, first of all, to be taken captive and marched to an unknown language. And that's the other thing, too, as you watch their journey, the tribes in the Congo all spoke different languages, right? They all said different dialects, so they didn't necessarily understand each other's language. When you're taken captive, you probably didn't speak their language. And then you start marching to this Portuguese holding cell in Angola, and you get there and they're speaking Portuguese. Who speaks Portuguese? Don't you have to raise your hand? There's probably somebody here that does. I'm going to guess. Just look at this brilliant group right here. Um, but they didn't. And the confusion and the difficulty and the, the agony that they had to endure was it's unnatural. So you have this going on, and, and you have 300 people. So 275 people have died now because somebody wanted a slave. Now, at this point in time is where the British colonies enter into the picture. They hadn't been a part of this up until this point. And they take these 25 to a place called Port Comfort in Virginia. And they trade them for food and supplies. Now, here's where, here's where it gets interesting to me. Because a lot of times we talk about, uh, the, the New York Times 1619 uh, series talked about how that was the beginning of slavery. Well, truthfully, in the British colonies, they didn't have, slavery wasn't given approval until 1661. There's some math here I want you to work with me on. A Virginia court in 1661 made slavery legal throughout the colonies. Prior to that, there was one permanent slave, a guy named John Bunch in 1641, similar situation, was an indentured servant, had one year from what I've read, left in his indentured servanthood, decided he didn't want to do it and ran away. Him and a couple of other guys as well tried to escape their last year of indigenous servitude, got caught, were taken to court, and tried as runaways. They were convicted of the crime. Two guys are white, John Bunch was black. The two white guys, you have one more year of indigenous servitude added to your seven. So they're going to have to end up doing eight years. Mr. Bunch, you are now a permanent slave. Now, all that to say, if you understand this, at that time, life expectancy was about 32 years. If you think about it, those 25 original indentured servants that were sold or traded at, at uh, Port Comfort, Virginia, they either died or were liberated from their indentured servanthood. Which is, it explains, if you think about it, why there were free blacks in the British colonies. There were, because they did their indigenous that they were emancipated and life changed. Now, that doesn't excuse what happened after that, because then we see this emergence of what is purely evil and driven by economics. How many of you guys know that people do bad things because they think they get lots of money? Not us, though. We don't do that, right? Right. I just want to be clear on that. You guys, we don't do we don't do that stuff. But I was just 
We don't do it, right? Just checking. Nobody here does. All right, good. Uh, but take advantage of people for money is a bad thing. But we watched the, the emergence of this institution of slavery, and it became a very almost prideful thing. As a matter of fact, if you study world history, the origination of the term or label of being a black person came out of the 1661 Virginia court environment. And it was a simple tool to create a mindset of superiority for being white and inferiority for being black. That's what they were doing. That was their goal, that was their plan, that's what their intent was. Somebody felt better about that. As we move forward and we see this thing in the emergence, most people don't know about the institution of slavery in the South during that time was that there began to be a demographic pattern emerging that the slaves outnumbered the free people in many of the communities. If you think about it, it makes sense. If you have a cotton operation and you've got a family of, we'll say, 12 people, but you need 50 people to work that land to make it productive, you get outnumbered pretty quick. And you started having uprisings and people wanting to, 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 to get away and be free. And some people did escape and they went to the north where they could be free. But, but it was a struggle. It was a real struggle. It was a difficult struggle. It was something that people had to face and people had to face with their own conscience. Not every person in the colonies had a slave. In fact, most didn't. But it was tolerated. And it grew and it was a poison. And so it became very interesting when our founders penned the Declaration of Independence and its implications. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But before, as things began to get stirred up, again, there were slaves who'd run, they would escape and to the north and, and find freedom. One guy I want to talk about as we move into the what I call the American phase of this story, because up until this point, it's been the British colonies. It was in 1770. A slave by the name of Crispus Attucks. How many of you have ever heard of that name, Crispus Attucks, before? He was labeled as the first martyr of the American Revolution. I'll tell you a little bit more about his story. He was a slave in Maryland, and he escaped with the help of his girlfriend. That's not people helping people. But he escapes, and he goes to Boston. And in Boston, he gets a job as a fisherman. And they would go out on the Atlantic Ocean and, and fish Monday through Friday. And on Fridays they would come in and they would go to a tavern and have a beer and, and talk about the week. Crispus Attucks was a black man who worked in 1770 on an integrated fishing crew. Who knew, right? Back then they had integrated workplace. Back then, when they went to the tavern, he didn't go to one room over here where all the white guys went over there, and there were more than, he wasn't the only black guy on the ship. But they would go and socialize together, which is kind of interesting when you think about the narrative that we are told about division. And don't kid yourself, I'm not kidding myself, division was there, division was real, and it was deliberately set in place. By calling you black, which means inferior, and you white, which means superior, to create a psychological dynamic that we're still fighting with today. But Christmas Addicts is a message and another side of that story. Because one day, after he and his buddies had gone fishing all week and they came in on Friday, they went to the tavern to have a beer, the Redcoats come in. The colonists have been kind of a little bit of an uprising. They're thinking about, you know, this idea of the control of King George and taxation without representation and the unjust nature of British rule over us when they're not even here. And so the Redcoats were sent to begin to quell this little rebellion. We need to stop this because this is intolerable. We can't allow people to speak out against the king. And so the Redcoats walk into the tavern when the fishermen are having their beers and begin to push them around and tell them, you, need, you can't talk about certain things, you can't do certain things, and they stood up to him. And it was at that time that Christmas Addicts and two others were shot and killed, I think two or three, were shot and killed, and Addicts was the first one. That's why he's often called the first martyr of the American Revolution. 
after he was killed, and two other, two or three others were killed, and the others were white, they were laid in state at Vinewell Hall in Boston, Massachusetts. Anybody ever been to Boston? Boston. If you ever get there, Vinewell Hall is a fascinating place. You want to talk about American history and kind of the, the revolution and all the different things that became a part of our story. It's really fascinating. But they laid in state, they were given honor and recognition by their community as significant people. Blacks and whites together. They didn't put one over here, the guy over there. They were together. There was a sense there. And it really helps you understand when you think about what our founders first wrote when this revolution really began in earnest. When the, they penned those immortal words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their, by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When they wrote that, it meant more than simply, we don't want to be under British rule. They meant we're committed to a way of life that recognizes the value of each and every person. Each person, regardless of skin color, regardless of gender, value created in the image of God and worthwhile and deserving of freedom. That was their opinion. Now, well, yeah, but what happened after that? We all know, right? We won the revolution and then we had slavery for about 90 years after that. How do we jive those two? How do you jive that reality that you say all men are created equal, yet you live in a different way? And I think it's really as simple as this. You had a couple of situations or circumstances that warranted or quote unquote, I wouldn't say justified, but an explanation as to why they did what they did. They knew that slavery as an institution was wrong, but they were dependent on it on a couple of different levels. First level was we just had gone through a war with the British, right? We went through a war with the British and we defeated them. But they were looking to get their land back. And if at that time, when we ratified the Constitution in 1789, when we uh, began this thing called America, if we would have said to the South, you can't do that anymore. First of all, it would have destroyed their total economy. They wouldn't have been able to survive financially. Oh, well, they probably could have been smart to figure something out. Um, I was going to say no, they wouldn't because they're Southerners, but that would be bigoted, and I'm not going to be that guy. Um, but that was part of the reasoning. If you remember the War of 1812, you guys remember that, right? Where the British came back and tried to do some things over here. Well, if the South had worked with them, we may have lost that battle. So that was a pragmatic decision on their part. The other piece, frankly, was financially. Economically, they had to hold that. But it was despised. It was an institution that began to change immediately. And you might ask me, so how do you know that things change immediately? You're probably thinking that, right? So here's how I know. The first state to abolish slavery, some people think it might be like 1865, right? 1777. In 1777, Vermont abolished slavery. Why? Why, why? why do that? Because that little thing called the Declaration meant something to them. That little thing called the Declaration was important to them. And so they did it. And not only they, but Massachusetts, uh, Philadelphia, or I guess it would be Pennsylvania, right? Um, in fact, by 1804, all the northern states had abolished slavery. We don't hear that part of the story, but it's a very much a part of the American story. As they begin this thing called America, this, this freedom, this, this place of, of independence, of recognizing all men being created equal, we were making progress. We are moving forward. In fact, you could argue that from the day they penned the Declaration of Independence, it was the beginning of the end of slavery. It couldn't, they couldn't coexist forever. It just wasn't right, and they knew it. And so as we begin to unravel and, and fall apart, we move toward the Civil War. And we see an emergence of things, and whether it's the, the Underground Railroad or whether it's uh, the, the abolitionist movement, all the pieces of a puzzle that shaped what we became as a nation and what we are becoming had two things. 
First of all, cooperation. We always hear about Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad. But think about this. Harriet Tubman being a slave, how would she know where to go and be safe? How would she know which plantations would have a place to hide and give her safe passage? There's a guy named Isaac Hopper, read about him. He was a white guy. 20 some years before Harriet Tubman showed up, he was at work putting this, place, this system in place. He was at work setting this up because you know what? There were a lot of people who didn't agree with the institution of slavery and they wanted to see it changed. And here was a guy committed to it, but it required everybody working together and then that people had a will to work. People came together and they had a will to work. That's how we change this nation. That's how things begin to shift. And we see this movement and it moves forward and we get to the Civil War. And I want you to think, I don't think we really have the sense of gravity of the significance of the Civil War in terms of American history, but even in human history. Because slavery has been a part of an institution forever, and still is to this day. And you look at the Roman Empire, where for a thousand years they had slaves. You look at the, the, the Jews in Egypt for 400 years in slavery. I mean, there was that was, and you can go to Africa, you go to Asia, slavery. It's there. But there's only one nation that said, we abhor this institution so substantially that we will send a half a million of our own to die for the liberation of those people. Think about that. Greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends, says the Gospel of John. And when you think about a nation, and there's only one that I've ever seen in the study of human history, that said, we have people in slavery and bondage and they're suffering, they're being oppressed. We'll send our sons and daughters to die so that they can find their freedom. That's amazing. And that's America. That's part of our story. Isn't a perfect story? There is no such thing as perfect perfection under heaven. But it's an incredible story. And I challenge you, go study your history books and find another nation that sent its own to die to liberate the slaves they control. America did that. It was a statement. That was the beginning of something amazing. President Lincoln said this shortly after the Civil War, <clears throat> actually going into the Civil War, he said these words. He said, lost my thought there. <laughs> okay, Lincoln quote, where is that tape? You guys remember what I was going to say? Um, Battlefield was bloody. The war had been raging. And they weren't really sure which way it was going to break. And then Lincoln said this he said, The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate for the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulty. And as our task is new, we must think anew, we must act anew, and then we will save our country. That's what Lincoln said. That's what his pledge and his devotion when stepping into that civil war. And he didn't stand alone. You can talk about Frederick Douglass, you can talk about Harriet Tubman, you can talk about all the, the men and women who said, you know what, yes, we're gonna stand for this, and we're willing to lay down our lives, literally, to see this evil taken away from our land. In the face of those challenges, they took a stand for what was right. And in taking a stand for what was right, they literally changed the world. That was the beginning. It wasn't the end. Obviously, we know we went through the Civil War, bloody battle, bloody war. We won. 
And if you go back and you read the documents of Abraham Lincoln and his plans for reconstruction, you see a path forward that involved inclusion and, and empowering people in leadership roles and responsibility moving forward. But then Abraham Lincoln is assassinated. And it redirected the American journey. It took us down that path called Jim Crow. I think there's an interesting parallel between Israel coming out of Egypt, the, the Old Testament story of how the Jews were taken into captivity in Egypt and for 400 years held in bondage. And when they came out, they passed through the Red Sea. The Red Sea was an ocean of water. The Red Sea in America was the blood of 500,000 martyrs. That was the Red Sea. Now, the interesting parallel there is that the Jews came out of Egypt and went from the Red, through the Red Sea into the wilderness. They didn't go to the Promised Land. They went to the wilderness. They had a stopover, as it were. And we came out of Egypt, as it were, out of the institution of slavery into our own wilderness called Jim Crow. Label it the Ku Klux Klan. Call it all manner of evil that began to emerge and, and seek to oppress people by laws that when they couldn't have slaves, they sought other ways. And a lot of different institutions. And, and again, Lincoln's plan was reconstruction, was, it was reparations, your 40 acres and a mule to help people get started. Andrew Johnson said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. After Lincoln's assassination, the whole plan changed. We started going in a different direction. And instead of empowering the people who'd been oppressed, Andrew Johnson actually empowered the oppressor again to allow them to begin to have control over how things were done in the South. And that's where we know about these Jim Crow laws that affected, infected our nation. But we fought. We didn't give up. And I find it interesting as I grew up in the 1960s, kind of at the end of the Civil Rights Movement, as a black man, seeing how things were, I grew up my drive and passion. I was going to be a black panther. That was what, because I, my desire was to overcome the evil and oppression that held me and my people from moving forward in our lives. And when you listen to the great orators of our time, of that time, specifically Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, you listen to their message, and they were fighting for the right of self-determination. I remember being a young boy and, and hearing a, a news clip where they were talking to Malcolm X and said, why do you have such a chip on your shoulder? And his response was, it's not a chip on my shoulder, it's your boot on my neck. And until we deal with that, we can't go forward. So that's where this little guy, growing up in the 1960s, wanted to be a Black Panther. Because I thought that's how we're going to overcome. And then something happened on the way in that journey. As a kid, a little junior high boy, I, I had my first white friend. I didn't socialize with white people at that time, like where I grew up uh, as families, and certainly not as kids. And it was at football practice, I met this kid named Charlie Wolf, and Charlie and I just bonded. We walked to and from school together, and just something about him. I liked him, he liked me. And one day he goes, hey, you want to come over to my house? I said, sure. Now, to you guys, that's no big deal, but back then, you didn't have that stuff. Black guys didn't go to white guys' houses. It's just weird, right? So I said, sure, I'll go. And that, right after that, he says, well, I got to tell you. I was like, oh, okay, great. What are you going to tell me? He says, well, um, my dad uh, fought in World War II. And he was leading a battalion of black soldiers in the conflict. And they abandoned him. He survived, but he hasn't spoken to a black person since. And I thought, sure, I'll still come over because I'm kind of a risk taker. So I went over and got to meet his mom and dad. And they became really good friends of mine. In fact, that day, the very first time I was there, his father pulled me aside and he goes, hey, just want to tell you, you know, anytime you want to stop by, you're always welcome. He goes, even if Charlie's not here, feel free to come on over and I have a glass of Kool-Aid or milk or whatever and we, we can talk. And that family really engaged me, loved me, and we're still friends with family to this day. So it was a real genuine thing, a real positive thing as part of my background. Well, sometime later, some months later, I decided I'm, I'll, I was, uh, I grew up in a non-Christian or non-religious household. We didn't go to church, didn't study both the Bible, we didn't do all the, the religious things. But one day, uh, when I was in the seventh grade, I 
hear the gospel on a Thursday night on a TV program. And I thought, I'm going to accept Jesus and I'm going to start going to church. So that Sunday, you leave me alone. Uh, that Sunday, I decided to go to church. And I walk into the church and I sit down in a pew and couldn't tell you a word the pastor said that day. Sorry, Pastor Sonis, it happens. Um, couldn't tell you where he said, but there are two women, one of them in front of me. Uh, two women in front of me, one of them said I didn't belong there. The other one said I shouldn't even be there. And for this little 13-year-old guy, that was like messed up my heart. I mean, it, it ripped me. It, it made me feel like I didn't belong. And, and I, when I left there, I was never going to come back. I felt rejected. And the irony of it was it was a black church. And you think, okay, and, and for my little mind, remember, I'm a black panther. I'm the guy we're going to overcome. And I started seeing this dichotomy of some people treat you with kindness. Some people are kind to you. And for that 13-year-old boy, I started to begin to think about life in a different way. I started to think about people as people, not as your wife, therefore I can expect this from you, and you're black, so I can expect this from you. It was, no, you know, I'm going to walk this journey with you. We're going to be friends. We'll see how that goes. And sometimes people don't do the right thing. Now, as a young boy, I thought, might, have been, might as well have been the whole church screaming at me, you don't belong. When you're 13, that's how you took it. But the truth is, it was two individuals who said some things that were mean. And who, why would they say it? I don't know. Don't care to know. But I understand contextually it was two people talking, not a whole church rejecting me. But as a kid, the big picture for me was some people are this way, some people are that way. And I learned to grow, and I began to change the way I viewed the world, the way I looked at life. And I was one of those guys who growing up as a young boy was told I'd be dead or in jail before I was 18, I would never amount to anything. All the negatives you could throw at a person were heaped at me. Uh, and a lot of times it was people closest to me. And it was something that I had to understand. But for me, my motivation, my inspiration as it were, was I wanted to be a football player. That was my passion, that was my drive, and, and that was my purpose in, in so many ways. And so I poured myself into getting as good at that game as I possibly could and worked at it and worked at it and one of those uh, difficult moments my it's my junior year in high school i sit down with the guidance counselor uh, and about my plans for college because they did it to everybody right <clears throat> and my guidance counselor told me he goes you know you're just not college material yeah he said that to me you feel bad about that don't you? I said, yeah, thanks somebody cares um <laughs> But no, he told me, and, and I, I'm pretty sure the reason was he had five of my older siblings before me and they had all dropped out of high school. He assumed that that was kind of the way I was. And had I not been driven by this passion for football, I probably would have dropped out of high school. I probably would have given up at that point. I probably would have allowed his words to dictate my future, but I had a better dream. I had something that motivated me beyond what somebody else thought of me. And I can't encourage you anymore than don't worry about what people think of you. Know what you want to be in your heart. There's a Shakespeare uh, quote and from Hamlet where he says, To thine own self be true. For surely as night follows day, in doing so you cannot be false to anything. And I think about that reality of to your own self be true. One of the challenges, we don't even give ourselves, we don't like it. We don't take time to know ourselves. And so we can't be true to ourselves. We're so busy trying to fit in, so busy trying to appease and, and, and make other people comfortable that we don't embrace who we are to be our true selves. But it's only in becoming our true selves that we're able to have the greatest positive impact in this world that we live in. And all of us has that, have that as a heritage. All, all of us have the capacity to do remarkable good in the world and make a positive impact in other people's lives. But we have to come to that place where we know who we are and we understand our true selves and we're committed to being us. People oftentimes talk about, oh, you know, you can't you know, sell out and blah, blah, blah. You know what? I'm gonna encourage you young people to sell out for yourself. Devote everything about you to becoming the best you you can possibly be. Don't let the naysayers tell you what you can or cannot become but actually embrace what is God-given talent in you, live it to the best of your ability, and expect great things. You do that, you're going to have a wonderful life. Don't get caught up in trying to fit into what somebody thinks of you. You might fit in over here, do this or that, but really get into being self. 
And one of the most disparaging parts, when you look at the history uh, and the issues of slavery, the whole black-white thing, when you create a dichotomy that says to one person, you don't fit, you don't belong, the other person, you're better than you actually are, that really messes people up. And it doesn't just affect the colors, we all know that. We all, as human beings, we see that. But we have an opportunity, this is where we go, we have an opportunity to do something really great and special. Now I know that from 1865 to 1965, when I look at my community, the, the black community, we may have been poor, but we had typically two parent households, a faith-centered community, we didn't have violence, we didn't have crime, we didn't have the chaos that we have today. After 1965, ironically, when really the gates were flung open, uh, we accomplished a lot in the Civil War. The Civil Rights Movement, or Civil War. Civil War, that was a significant accomplishment too. But the Civil Rights Movement opened the door for a lot of opportunity. But there was a parallel movement in American history with the Civil Rights Movement. And it kind of got twisted in, around 1965. And we started seeing what they call the Great Society Programs. And I was one of those people who happened to live in that experience of Great Society Program, we were a welfare family. And I watched how my stepdad had to disappear sometime because the welfare man was coming. And I thought about how dehumanizing that must have been for him. And I think about how it had to create something in his soul that made life really hard for him. But he hung in there. But that was a pattern that began to emerge. And what did that do? It began to create the breakdown of the family. When you look at the black community in specific and American in general, uh, families began to fall apart because there was this false dichotomy that the government was going to fill that void that only a family could fill. And that began to, families began to break up. The other piece of that puzzle came out of the 1960s. There was a Time Magazine, some of you guys who were there will remember this, Time Magazine uh, front page cover, God is Dead. It's a declaration. That's what a lot of people believe. And that's when we begin to see the movement. You can't have the Ten Commandments here. You can't pray here. You can't do this there. And we thought by eliminating a person's ability to express their religious faith, we'd somehow make the world a better place. And it didn't work, frankly. And we move this, and we see this dynamic, and we see things beginning to emerge. And it's an emergence of something that we begin to think, what does that mean? And we start seeing this thing come along, and, and it was part of the, the movement until the late 1980s when we heard there was, anybody ever hear this thing called white privilege? Anybody ever hear that? It's a concept, it's the idea that just by virtue of your skin color, you got it made. Life is easy. And if I ask you guys, who has an easy life? Raise your hand if you've had the easy life. There's one, two. Okay, you guys are different than the rest of us. Okay, have you had an easy life? If you had an easy life, was it because of your skin color that your life was easy or because of the choices you made? Because the truth is, typically, life is what you make of it. And it's how you choose to live. And I know people, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, you name it, native people that have said, you know what? I'm going to love my family. I'm going to love my spouse. I'm going to be committed to these values. I'm going to work hard and be responsible. And somehow, those people seem to end up in really good places, or at least better places. And then we look at people that we say, okay, I made a choice that I'm going to have four kids, three different women, and I'm not going to marry any of them, and I'm not going to take care of the kids. And then those kids grow up, grow up in that environment and think that that's acceptable and we perpetuate a lifestyle that creates hardship and difficulty. And that's part of the story, that's part of the struggle. And that's part of coming out of the 1960s, the path we chose. And we've seen an implosion of the family. We've seen an emergence of violent crime and drugs and, and, and all the things that are, we, we don't want to see, but they're here. Now, we've created this paradigm that says, well, the reason why it's that way is because of racism. And I think that's unfair. I think that is not, not a true statement. I think that most 
of life's decisions and most of life's outcomes are predicated upon the choices that I make and decisions that I take and the path that I choose to walk. And if I choose not the best ways and things don't go my way, it's not because of what somebody over there might think of me. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that racism doesn't exist. I'm not saying there aren't evil people, but I'm, what I am saying is that I don't believe that there's this grand conspiracy to keep me from pursuing and accomplishing what I want, or there used to be, in a huge way. But I believe that right now, what we can do as individuals and how we change this, because here's, here's what I know about the truth. The lady who wrote the, the white privilege is actually a college paper. Uh, her name's Barbara McIntosh. Uh, her father was like number two at U.S. Steel, which was the largest steel uh, conglomerate in the U.S. and had oodles and oodles of cash. He was like the top one-tenth of one percent of wealthiest people in America, perhaps in the world. Her privilege wasn't white, it was green. If your parents have money, if you've got money, the doors open wide in so many ways. And it's kind of interesting as we look at the wrestling match our nation has been enjoying uh, with in terms of this concept of critical race theory and some of the things that people believe uh, is that I've had conversations with 30 something year old whites who were pretty dogmatic with me about how, yeah, racism was this, this problem, that problem. And, and I've literally been told not a joke, by people 30 years younger than me that I didn't understand the black experience in America. <laughs> but they knew better than I did what I had been through. Think about the arrogance of that. Think about the superiority in that, or the supremacy in that statement. But the truth of the matter is, we're all a byproduct of our choices and the choices of those that influence who we, how we live. But when I create the construct, here's the deadly nature of this concept of critical race theory when it says that just by virtue of your skin, you oppress me. And just by virtue of the, my skin, I'm a victim. If I, my circumstance, is a result of your behavior, then I don't have to change to get better. Now, how many guys believe that you don't have to change to get better? Right? Doesn't make any sense, does it? But that's part of a, uh, of a theory that somehow, you know what? It's not your fault you're in that circumstance. It's racism. And it's a simple matter of this. If that becomes an excuse for me, then I don't have to try and change. And if I don't try to change, nothing gets better. And if nothing gets better, you can just keep saying it's because of racism. If we really want to change, we've got to begin to stand up and live in a way that we want others to treat us. That's where we all are. I am of the opinion that the best way to get rid of evil is to do good. Because see, here's the bottom line, darkness cannot drive out light. Be a light. As we look at our lives, we look at our futures, we look at our communities, here's a challenge today for all of us. What will we become? How shall we live? Will we curse the darkness? Or will we light a candle? Will we look back and talk about every bad thing that's ever possibly, possibly happened? What went wrong? What somebody did that shouldn't have been done? Because you know what? If we spend all day on that boat, we'll get what we see. If I'm talking about constantly how I was offended by this person over here or that person over there, guess what? When I meet those people, I don't want anything to do with them. But if I begin to say, you know what? Maybe we can work together. How can we work together? What can happen that could possibly make things uh, better for all of us? I was mentoring a young man, a high school student, a senior, and he was failing in English class, a required course that if he didn't get it, he didn't pass it, he doesn't graduate. 
who's got to repeat his senior year. It's a good kid, responsible kid, good student, normally, based on his class. I asked, I said, Billy, I said, help me understand what's going on here. And he said, the teacher's racist, that's what it is. I said, really? I said, well, why do you think the teacher's racist? And he said, well, everybody knows. If that's your answer, huh? Uh, and, well, and I, my, and I love Billy, and I actually, I knew the teacher. The teacher was a friend of mine. And I asked him, I said, uh, so, well, before we make that final conclusion, would you do me a favor? Would you go and ask the teacher what you need to do to get your grades right? And he engaged, took a lot of courage, because he was afraid. He thought this person had already rejected him. But he had the courage to go and talk to her and ask her, can you help me understand what I need to be doing? And she began to work with him. She began to meet with him after school. She began to help him understand what she needed from him. And he ended up getting a B out of the class. And he found out that this lady wasn't a racist. She was actually a friend of his. And to this day, she's a mentor to him. Give people a chance. All of us. Some of us fall. We fall down our face. We make mistakes. We do things wrong. Or maybe I'm the only one here that's ever done anything wrong. We have probably. That's probably true. Um, but no, we all do things wrong. And we, when we do something wrong, we want people to understand, hey, I can be better. I can do better. Well, let's just try and be better. Here's the answer if you want to light candles. Be a positive person in your sphere of influence. And a uh, positive person doesn't mean Pollyannish and only see the bright lights and all the good stuff. You got to reckon good people see bad things and they confront it. They call it out. Good, see pe good people see opportunities to do good things, and they do them. They act on them. And when they do, positive things happen. Here's one I want to challenge you. I'll leave you with this. We're going to take some time for questions. As you engage your day, think about this. First and foremost, think about who you are. And it's important that you can recognize yourself as a good person who does good things, who helps others, who cares about those around them. Be that person. And then look at other people and say, I see the good in you. I see the potential in you. I believe in you. You know, there's so many people that I talk to and I say, you ever tell you how awesome you are? No. What's some amazing things about you? It's like these two waiting to go like a big deal out of these guys, but <laughs> sit at their house today and they just love people. They're just good people. They like people. They just make you feel welcome and valued. And you know what? Whether anybody knows has ever told you or not, you are valued. You're loved. You're appreciated. You're significant. You mean something. When I was, uh, my kids were young, my daughter oldest is 35 now, and she was uh, about seven years old, we were watching the miniseries Roots. If you haven't seen that, it's about a guy's journey and understanding his roots from, from Africa and his family were slaves and coming through all, all the, the journey here. My daughter watches this movie or the show and she turns to me, she goes, Dad, how much am I worth to you? I'm like, wow, okay, that's what you get from that, huh? And I look at her and I said, sweetheart, you're worth all the money in the world, plus a dollar. And in her little seven-year-old mind, she understood that. All the money in the world, there's no other dollars left. You're worth more than anything else in the world. Still is. And I think, when I think of people, when I look at people, and I choose to relate to people that way, you're a valuable person. Every one of you, every person in this room has value and worth that we need to tap into. We need you. We need your words, we need your hands, we need your involvement to make this world a better place. Because if you, everybody gets on board and starts saying, you know, how many positive things happen in your world today? And it's just, there's so much here. And I, I used to coach uh, youth soccer. And we had little eight-year-old boys running around the soccer field. First of all, I don't know anything about soccer, but my older son played for a guy who did, so I just copied him. Um, so I'm teaching these kids soccer, but I'm teaching them to expect good things from the game. I expect yourself to be good at this, and you can do this, you can overcome this. And I had this one little guy, his name was Tyler, and Tyler was timid. You know those timid kids? When somebody runs out, they kind of turn around the other way. 
And but we would always talk about. We had our five rules of, of, of sport. Number one, honor your mother and father. Number two, work hard. Number three, help your teammates. Number four, respect your coach. Number five, have fun. That's that was those are our rules. And when you have a chance to make a difference, go for it. But I think you got. And we started this little thing where. With Tyler, who was a little bit passive, we would just say whenever he got in the game, and I always made everybody play all the positions, but he was playing defender. And we would, our rule was if you're a defender, you gotta attack the ball. You gotta go be it, you gotta go after it. And this little guy just wouldn't. And one day we were playing against, we were, we were like one or two in the league, we we're playing against the other really good team, and their best player gets a breakaway. And the only person between him and the goal is Tyler. And everybody knows Tyler might just duck and run right now, but he didn't. He attacked. He attacked, and he took the ball away from the guy. Moved the other way. And this little guy who had always been kind of quiet in the mirror, he was, yeah, he was fired up because he dared to take on a challenge that seemed too daunting most of the time. And when he did and he had success, he began to believe in himself. And from that point forward, he was an impact player. <laughs> And in so many ways, we've got challenges. We've got, mind, we've got thoughts and mindsets that bombard us, that convince us that what we're up against is impossible. But if we'll simply make a choice to give it everything we've got in the moment, to be a person who cares, to be a person who helps, to be a person who wins the moment, we can make this world a better place. So I'm going to stop there. We've got time for some questions. I've written a book. I've actually, I'm the second one's in progress. I've written a book, and, I, and my apologies, this is called Poor Planning. They're in a, my uh, stores in a box in Kansas City. Uh, but it, it's, it's called Game Changer, Setting Your Mind to Win. My second book, which I'm working on, uh, is going to be titled Rethinking Race uh, and, and Making the World a Better Place is what we have an opportunity to do. And I have um, had some personal stuff I went through last summer that um, I didn't get it finished yet, but it should be done by the end of the year. Next question. Oh, I have a question. So, the 30-year-old that responded that you didn't know about racism, how did you respond back to him? Uh, I, I, said, I said, do you really believe that? And I think that's, that's my, my deal is, if somebody get, hit, throws that at me, I'm, well, why do you think that? And then he didn't answer my question, because, he understood it didn't make any sense, but he believed it. He, he's convinced that he was right. And I can't imagine going to someone 30 years my senior and saying that kind of thing, but he was, yeah. So, but yeah, I, I just, I, I don't, I, I don't engage in that. It's, uh, there's a, a proverb that says, don't answer a fool in his folly. So it's like, there's no point. Anything else? Here. Yes. Black, 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 Machine and it is political it becomes what it begins to divide people and cast this idea uh, And in essence one of the things this is you, that's a really good question because you made me think about some of the things that really uh, To me, I think are really frustrating because here's the thing. I feel like in a lot of ways We have it's, it's what I call blackface <clears throat> We say it's black lives matter, but when we dig inside and look at the agenda, there's way more It's not simply about black people but in this country, if you can make it about race, we've created a world where if it's racism, the black guy is always right. Never forget that. But that's not true. We've created, so if we say it's black lives that matter, and it means we burn down our communities and we shoot police officers, then you can't be against that because after all, black lives matter. But the truth is it's not about black lives. 
because if it was about black lives, maybe you'd go help the folks in New Orleans right now, not just protest certain things. And I, and I think so. I think it's uh, it's been it's been weaponized in so many ways politically. Just so it, and I'm not sure what the end game is. What's the point? What are we trying to accomplish? Because here's the the whole concept. There is that it wants to cast America into this dynamic of you hate me because of your skin color. You don't want me to be around because of my skin color. And is that true? No, it's not. And it's like, okay, so why would we go, why would we beat that drum? Because of some other things we want to accomplish. Because it comes from Black Lives Matter to defund the police. From Black Lives Matter to you can't teach, if you're a white person, you can't teach a black student. It's like, what? Hold on. And yeah, those things have been verbalized to me in person. And it's like, that, we can't go down that path. So that's my, my thought. Black lives have mattered for a long time, and it, what didn't start in 2014? Well, I sort of, I believe, I mean, I grew up in the 50s and in high school. Yeah. And there was segregation in the town where, where they, they lived in one area of town. Yes. Uh, but as I went to college, I went to school side by side of them. Never bothered me a bit. Yeah. Um, so I'm saying, I don't know about all the street. Yeah. Um, well, I think. What I think is politicians and newscasts are more racist than anybody because what matters is when, like, our vice president is African American or it's the first African American to win this. If that should matter. Right. People are people. But when we cast that division, we create a natural divide. And I don't know the end game. I don't know why people think that's important. But you raise a great point. It's understanding how far we've come. I grew up in a segregated community. Like I said, I, I was, what, 12 years old the first time I went to a white person's house. And it's, it's different. Things are changing. Things are moving forward. So last summer, I was at a friend of mine, actually a client, a uh, 50-ish year old white female. And we met at a coffee shop. And we sat out on the patio and we were talking about the different things and I'm laughing and enjoying each other's company. And we're talking about, that's right after the George Floyd situation uh, in, in Minneapolis and, and how divided our country was. And she said, do you think it's worse now than it was in the 1960s? And I said, no, no I don't. I said, because bottom line, if it was 1960 and me, a black man, was sitting in a public place with you, a white female, laughing and enjoying each other's company, you would have been sent home to your room to figure out what you did wrong, and I'd be taken to the nearest tree and strung up. Now, are you telling me America's that way now? Because it used to be. Things, we move forward, and we don't, we don't light the candles, we'd rather talk about how bad things were back on this day. And we create narratives that, that further poison the well as it were. And you can think about the, the George Floyd was, I remember the first time I saw a picture of what happened to that man, and I was incensed. I prayed a prayer that probably other men have prayed as well. Lord, I know vengeance is yours, but can I get this one? I want to go there and, and deal with that guy. And all of a sudden it became the whole of America was guilty of, of Derek Chauvin's crime. And it wasn't as one dude that made a decision leading a group of guys to kill another man, and that's wrong. But when we try to brand a whole nation as guilty of its crime, that's not right. That's worse, actually, maybe, I can't say it's worse, but that's just evil. And then you ask yourself, well, why do we want to create that narrative? And I remember uh, back in 2014, when we started hearing uh, the, the Michael Brown case in St. Louis, which was an interesting story, and I have friends in Ferguson, I know some different things, but, but at the end of the day, we hear about how racist police shoots this 18-year-old black kid who happened to be 6'4", 300 pounds, big guy, who happened to be trying to take the officer's gun from him to do harm to him. But the bigger piece is that officer 
was investigated by the city of St. Louis to determine whether or not he acted appropriately, and he was exonerated. He was investigated by the Missouri Attorney General and exonerated. He was investigated by President Obama's Justice Department and exonerated of any wrongdoing. But he was labeled as a racist murderer and he could never work in law enforcement again. And you think, okay, how did we get on that track? We made it sound like every time there's a police encounter with a black person, we have these negative outcomes. And I know that's not true, because you're not gonna believe this, but I've actually been stopped by the police. <laughs> you didn't think that was possible. No, actually, there, well, now I can tell a couple of things. I was uh, coaching youth football. You might, there's a common theme in my background, I, I coach stuff. Uh, but um, I was uh, coaching uh, youth football, and me and my son and two other kids were coming back from practice to this area in Kansas City, Cass County. It's labeled as, you know, redneck, racist, or whatever. And uh, one of the boys in the back seat, we're on the way home, yells out, my mama said that if you get stopped by the police in Cass County, you're in big trouble. Okay, I'm not sure why you felt like you had to say that right there, but okay. Uh, and you know what happened next, right? Yeah, I got stopped by the police. Right after like two minutes later, I get pulled over, officer says, license, registration, I give him the stuff, and, and he goes, you know how fast you're going? I see about 45, he says, well, it's 35 an hour speed. So I said, sorry, I didn't realize. Uh, he takes my license and registration, goes back to the police car, and you ever wonder what they, what they do back there? Anybody ever been stopped by a police officer? I don't, don't, don't confess right now. Uh, we're not gonna judge you though. But, um, but they go back there, it's like, they, they, write a, they write a book or a, they call their mom or something. I mean, it's like, what are you doing back there? But he comes back to my car. He says, uh, sir, have you had any work uh, done on your speedometer lately? No, sir. Uh, did you get new tires? Because sometimes I can throw off your speedometer. No, sir. He's trying to give me an excuse, right? I'm like, ah, no, no, I, I don't take the excuses. He says, well, okay, be careful. Hands me my license and my insurance stuff. Takes off, end of story. This kid in the back seat comes undone. He goes, oh my God, what just happened? And it's like, oh, that's kind of been my experience with law enforcement. And I can tell you a couple of years ago, I was driving uh, in the uh, Lee Summit, my community in Kansas City, and Going westbound, this is a warning to you people who like to look at your phones when you're driving. Um, I'm approaching an intersection and the light's green and I look down at my phone and I look up and the light's red now. And I can't stop, there's just no way. I'm going too fast, I can't stop. And I run the red light. And there's a police officer right there looking at me run the red light. And I, okay, game over. And I just pulled over. So I'm not going to make him chase me. I know what I just did. 30-something-year-old white kid. It seems like I always run the 30-something-year-old white people. But anyway, that's just, <laughs> I'll figure that out myself. But he pulls up beside me, looks at me, goes, you need to be careful, laughs at me, and drives off. Um, okay, you're not the guy they told me you were. Uh, but the bottom line is, human beings do bad things. And the minute we try to say only a certain color of people do wrong things, game over. We can't win that one. People do wrong things. As for you, as for us, let's make a choice to do right things. Darkness can't put out darkness. Only light can do that, right? Martin Luther King. Be a light. Hate cannot put out hatred. Only love can do that. We need to make choices in our individual lives, but as long as we buy into the collective narrative of skin color makes me, puts me in this camp, or ethnicity puts me in that camp, as long as that's my foundation, it's gonna be a tough sled, tough road to hope, because I'm never gonna be wrong because of me, I'm always gonna be wrong because you didn't do what you're supposed to do to make my life better. And at the end of the day, the world will be a better place if each of us chooses to do two things every day. Your task. Be the best you you can possibly be. 
and help someone else be their best self. If we all take that commitment, if we all make that decision, that's how we're going to live, then when an idiot shows up, he's going to expose himself. We've all been in that environment, right? Where that guy comes up and says something really stupid and nobody responds to him and he knows that he's wrong and he shuts up. Yeah, that's what we want. Uh, so make a commitment. If you make a commitment in your own life, and I'm not, I'm not here to judge anyone. I just think we ought to try to give it our best shot to be kind, to care, to help ourselves and to help each other. If we do that, the world's a better place. All right. One more question, two more questions. I don't know. My favorite NFL team? Kansas City Chiefs. I mean, is there anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Earlier today, you may have thought I had a Chiefs shirt on because I thought there might be some Bronco fans around here. Um, but apparently not. But you know, it's kind of funny how when you're when you're little, and this is the impressionability of, of, of humanity. It's not just kids, it's people. We're very impressionable. But when I was nine years old and the Chiefs won the Super Bowl, Loved it, man. That inspired my heart to be the best I could possibly be. And I think about that and how significant it was to me. And then I later in life to get to play for that organization and get to know some of the guys that I looked up to that were inspirational to me. This guy named Bobby Bell, who's a Hall of Fame linebacker. Might be the fastest hands on the planet. Uh, he's a guy, he's close to 80 years old now, but Bobby, you could put a quarter in your palm and he would put his hand underneath your hand, and before you could close your hand, he would get that quarter. And I watched him do it to people everywhere. So it's like, that's amazing. But I did watch those guys and to think about how they inspire me. But there was one thing about those guys, and there's black guys, white guys, whatever. They were comrades. They were brothers. They joined together. They were there for each other. And I, and I, again, I know it's like the band of brothers. Uh, and I, I would just so treasure the experience of being a part of that organization. Uh, and then I got to obviously got to know people, uh, namely Lamar Hunt. But after I was released by the Chiefs, I didn't even think to ask for my jersey. But about 10 years later, I sent Lamar Hunt, who's passed away some years ago, uh, I sent him a letter saying, hey, Mr. Hunt, would you mind, can I get my game jersey? And Here's an NFL owner who's got who knows how many things to do. In less than a week, I get a handwritten note with my game jersey, uh, number 64, saying thank you for what you do in the community, blah, 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 blah. But it's just like, who does that? There's a lot of good people. He blessed my life that day. The simple thing is that. It's like, who could you, here's a, here's a little, I guess you can say a practical application tonight. Uh, tomorrow, start thinking about whose life you're gonna make better tomorrow. Whose life are you gonna enrich tomorrow? And I think that when we be so consciously committed to doing good things that you don't have any room for the bad stuff. Be so committed to doing, to being kind that you can't be cruel. It's a challenge, but I dare you to do it. So, all right, I'll go. I don't know how more than I don't have no idea what time it is, and I can talk forever. You can ask my kids. Is there a question? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Could you speak to some of the systemic racism where the legacy of old racism plays into today? And I'm in healthcare, so I see it pervasively in things like kidney tests that are race norm for black people so they're at a lower rate of kidney transplant when needed. Um, oxygen levels don't be accurately on fingers because of the dark skin, and so they don't get proper treatment based on oxygen levels. And perhaps something more near and dear to you is the race norming at NFL CTP, which is very recent with treating people's head injuries because of the race idea of the legacy person the black people have lower compensation for it. So they get scored differently on CTE exams, therefore lower compensation for the NFL for head injuries. Yeah. I, honestly, I couldn't tell you the specifics on that. I will say this, and again, I don't know the science. I'm not the doctor. I know that there are conflicting notions in terms of CTE. Uh, I do think, this might sound a little bit harsh, I do think that people who love the game of football 
have a predisposition that might make them more vulnerable. But here's the other thing, is that we know that CTE occurs in people that don't play football. We know that happens in environments too. Uh, in terms of the healthcare side of it, I think that if you see those things happening, you, 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 have an, you raise your voice in that situation, call it out for what it is. Because most of us wouldn't, I wouldn't, what you just said to me, never heard of it. So when you say that now, there's, you know, bringing the light to that and understanding, I would think if, in terms of re referencing that as necessarily systemic, I don't, know if, I, I don't know if that would be categorically systemic racism. Uh, it may be, well, when someone's deliberately doing those things, why would they, who does that? That would be my first question. Well, that is the, that is the issue, is that people aren't doing that intentionally. It's who, the whole your colleagues, that. your colleagues do it? All in healthcare. No, I'm saying who specifically does it in your hospital, in your situation? It's not, it's not a personal thing. It's not an individual thing. It's a blood test. There's one blood test. Okay. It gets calculated differently for people who are identified as African-American. Who changes the calculations? That's the system problem. This is why we talk about it because it's not intentional. It's not yeah, but intentional. somebody has to change the calculation. Somebody has to. Because here's the thing about when you talk about blood, this I do know, is that I'm, my blood type is B positive. Imagine that, B positive. Think about it. Uh, but if there's someone here that needed a B positive blood transfusion, I didn't care what your skin color is, mine will work. That's reality. Now, I'm not, you get into the depth of what you're talking about, I'm really not sure. I do know that in terms of blood types, it's human blood, it's poor people. And you know this, there's been stories where uh, somebody's on a, needs a, a heart, and they've actually taken the heart of a white person and put it into a black person's chest, and it worked, and it stuck, it took, because you know what, we're all human beings. <laughs> so I, I'm really not sure in terms of all the, again, that's why on the systemic thing, I still think there's any time there's deliberate discrimination against another person, it's done by a person. It's done by an individual. And a lot of our health issues, while they may have had an ad more adverse effect on this people group or that people group, that it may be as much as anything a result of. of eating habits or exercise regimens. And I can tell you this personally, it's been about eight years ago, I went to the doctor, he informed me that I had high, some issues with high cholesterol. <clears throat> and what can we do about it? And we got into diet. And he informed me that blueberries and almonds, uh, broccoli, those things were really helpful in terms of dealing with uh, high cholesterol. And so I start eating those things. And instead of having a candy bar, I get some blueberries. It's better for me. And I, I snack religiously on almonds. It's almost always an open bag of almonds whenever I walk into the kitchen. There's a bag I have on. And guess where my cholesterol is? It's better because of the dietary choice I make. And I think there's a real value in helping people, all of us. I mean, we're all human beings. We can learn and we can improve ourselves. And I do I absolutely recognize the health challenges that uh, afflict the black community because I'm part of that community. And but I also know that it's diet and exercise can help in terms of creating better health. Uh, I do think that, again, CTE, I think there's a lot of science to be discovered uh, on that. Now, if you want to talk about the, the Tuskegee experiment, that was evil, pure evil. And I don't think it would happen in 2021 because we, we've evolved, we moved forward, we've gotten better. Um, so there was a comment made that we shouldn't recognize it. So the what now? There was a comment made that if we shouldn't recognize if they're the first black something that shouldn't matter. I, I kind of beg to differ with that with that statement mm -hmm. because it shows where we come from. Am I am I wrong to suggest uh, that? You know what? I think that in terms of I think the the context was when we create that we create a divide. I think that's that's a whole point. I believe that in terms of celebrating successes, celebrate human success, we all succeed. Because uh, I can tell you this, I, and I know this, and you know this, there are plenty of white people who are having first generation college graduates, even today. Celebrate that, 
I, I don't see, see a problem with, with the celebration. I, I don't think her intent with that. But when it's used to, say, divide, to say this thing or that thing, that, that, there is a side of that that's like, okay, well, wait a minute, hold on. I'm going to celebrate. I mean, I can't believe I didn't vote for Barack Obama. I'm going to celebrate the fact that he was elected. That's great. Good. He was elected. I didn't vote for Bill Clinton, but you might be seeing my politics now. Um, I didn't vote for Bill Clinton, but, you know, celebrate the fact this guy was our president. Uh, so uh, there's a lot that we can celebrate, but I think when we create this dynamic that fails to take into account all the stuff, and here's what I mean by that, when I say all the stuff. If I said to you, who is Reginald Lewis? You probably wouldn't know. But in 1983, Reginald Lewis, a black man, was the CEO of Beatrice Foods. Now those of us with gray hair understand that Beatrice Foods in the 1980s was the largest food conglomerate in the US. Reginald Lewis became the CEO. That's significant. And frankly, in a systemic racist system, he couldn't have possibly have done that in 1983. Wouldn't gonna happen. But in a merit-based system where he worked hard, he applied himself, you're, you're right there. I have not heard anybody talk about and celebrate that guy's success. There's so many, there's a lot of things that we can look at, but again, it comes back to that issue of, I can curse the darkness. I can look back and I can say, my guidance counselor told me I wasn't college material because I'm black. I can make that the issue. And I can pound that drum forever, but it doesn't move me forward. You know how I won that battle? I went to college. And I'm not going to talk about my freshman and sophomore academics, but my junior senior year had a 3.5 GPA. Uh, that proved him wrong without me saying a word to him. And in fact, I was invited back. This is a cool story. I was invited back for my uh, 40th, yeah, I've had that one, 40th class reunion to be the keynote speaker for all the graduating classes from, from our school, which was quite an honor. Uh, but there's a lot that happens in terms of our humanity. Now, if I could say, well, I'm the first black person to do that, I, I don't know if it was or wasn't. To me, it didn't matter. I was just happy to be part of the Google pirate history. Uh, so it's way more complex than saying, well, if it happens black, it's good. If it happens white, me, it just happens. Celebrate people, celebrate humanity. Celebrate each other. Um, that's where our win is. And it's not just this group or that group. Because I'm going to tell you this, and I know this because I've studied the history. There's plenty of things to look at in black history and say, I celebrate that. Plenty. There's plenty of things in white history to look at and say, I celebrate that. Human history. American history. Our founders, and, I, and I'm, uh, I feel blessed to be in America because we were founded by people who said, we the people, in order to form a more perfect union. In that phraseology, they acknowledge a progressive advancement of something that wasn't here yet. In order to form, we're going to form a more perfect union. We believe there's a better way of life, and we're going to invest ourselves into it and pursue it. That was our founders. I think the best des des description, we want to be successful people all of us. The best description I ever heard of success is this a guy, a guy named Paul T. Meyer. He said this. He said, Su success is a progressive realization of predetermined, worthwhile personal goals. The progressive realization of predetermined, worthwhile personal goals. If you think about that definition of success and you pair it with the Declaration of Independence and the preamble to our Constitution, you watch this nation's journey and you see a progressive realization of, of a predetermined, worthwhile goal, which was we the people, in order to form that more perfect union, to ensure justice, provide domestic tranquility, we are inheritors of that blessing. It's in our hands to live it. And we can celebrate that, or we can say, you know, we've had really had some bad stuff happen in the past. And you know, we wouldn't be wrong about the bad stuff, but we wouldn't be enjoying the good stuff. And I think we need to do that, doing the good stuff. So, all right, I think we're gonna.
Well, I don't know, maybe you, know, you tell me. Jenna, we done, we wrap for any more questions. I can talk all night, you guys probably know that by now. Uh, all right, so good, we're gonna wrap. Thank you guys so much for the scene. It's been a pleasure to be here. Believe in yourself, believe in your community, make it the best place you possibly can, and we're gonna have good things happen.